Sure, thanks to all of you uh, to be with us here on day two. So we're really honored to have uh, Steven Pinker with us. Many of you are familiar with his work. Um, he's the Johnson Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard. And he's one of our nation's most prominent and interesting and creative public intellectuals. Uh, he's written on many different subjects. He's the author of The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate. And the book that is really what we'll focus on more here is, is a, a really a fascinating work called The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. He's interestingly the chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary, so questions of words and naming <laughs> means a great deal. And he's been named one of the 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy and by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world today. So we're honored to have you with us today. Thank you. And I thought maybe you could begin our conversation with a, an overview of kind of the general arguments of your book, um, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. The, the thesis of The Better Angels of Our Nature is that um, despite what you, the impression that one gets from the headlines, uh, quantitative studies of violence show that it has uh, gone down over the course of history, over multiple scales of time and magnitude. This is true of uh, homicide. This is true of uh, treatment of children. Uh, this is true of uh, tribal raiding and feuding. But the numbers that I'll uh, mention this morning, given the themes of the conference, have to do with war. And this is largely a, uh, a trend of the last 70 or so years. That um, since 1945, if you count wars, and if you count the number of people killed in wars, and this is, by the way, very different from getting your impression of the world by looking at the headlines, because uh, news is, by definition, about things that happen, not about things that don't happen. Uh, we rarely see Wolf Blitzer uh, on the streets of Angola saying, here I am reporting live from a country that's not at war. Uh, <laughs> given uh, a world of 7 billion people, of almost 200 uh, countries, there's very likely to be a war somewhere. It will always uh, make the headlines. If you only concentrate on the headlines, you think the world that nothing has changed. It's only when you count up all of the parts of the world that are not at war and the number of people who uh, die peacefully in their sleep that you can really appreciate the trends. And here, here's what the trends seem to be. One thing, uh, if you look at the most destructive category of war, and that's war between two countries, especially two big, rich, powerful countries, uh, there has been a, a quite a dramatic decline. There's been no war between any two great powers since the end of the Cor Korean War in 1953. And um, interstate wars, government against government, uh, have been uh, going down. I don't think there has uh, been one uh, with a standard definition of war as uh, one where there's a, a, a conflict where there are at least uh, 1,000 deaths in a year. There hasn't been one since um, uh, 2003. Uh, and then just the number has uh, been gradually petering out. Wars between rich countries. There hasn't been a war between the countries of the, uh, the top 40 countries in terms of GDP uh, since uh, 1945. Wars in Western Europe, we kind of take it for granted that France and Germany are not going to fight a war anytime soon. But for most of the course of uh, human history, needless to say, that was not the case. Western Europe used to have uh, start two new wars a year for a span of 500 years. As of 1945, that went to zero. And of course, there were no wars between the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, contrary to every expert prediction that uh, World War III was uh, just, just a matter of time. And then there, there are the, the smaller wars, the uh, civil wars and the wars between uh, uh, less developed countries. Uh, those persisted after the decline of uh, war between big, rich, powerful countries. But those, too, have been going down in uh, number and in human, uh, the human toll. Uh, if you were to count the number of w verified war deaths uh, per capita, the numbers would look something like maybe 300 per 100,000 per year uh, during the worst years of World War II. That went down to about 30 per 100,000 per year during the years of the Korean War, down to the teens during the um, era of the Vietnam War, the single digits uh, in the uh, 70s and uh, 80s. 
down to about one for uh, most of this century, uh, uh, sorry, one in the, in the um, 1990s, and less than one in the 21st century. Now, the, there's been a small uptick in the rate of, uh, the number of wars and the rate of deaths in war over the last three years because of the um, Syrian civil war and the wars in the, in the um, aftermath of the Arab Spring, but even that has raised the rate uh, to, from about two-tenths of a war death per 100,000 people to about 0.8 uh, tenths of a war, uh, sorry, eight-tenths of a war death per uh, uh, 100,000 per year. So it is a quadrupling, but it's quadrupling from a really, really tiny number to a number that's only uh, a little bit worse. It's wiped out about uh, a dozen years of progress, taking us back to about 2002, uh, 2003, but nowhere near the levels of the, um, the 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s. So that's the uh, empirical datum that, uh, among others, I try to explain in The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, and it's one that, that is underappreciated if, uh, if you go by the headlines. Uh, I see my book as part of a general trend to try to uh, move people away from basing their assessment of the state of the world on subjective impressions and intuition and more towards uh, data and numbers. We've all seen revolutions in areas like sports with Moneyball, in political forecasting with 538, as opposed to uh, seat of the pants punditry. And uh, I'd like to see more of that in our analysis of uh, war and peace and in violence more generally. So, so this gets us to the title of this panel, which is why is violent conflict decreasing in the long term? So, so you've given us compelling data that we've seen these decreases, specifically in war, but underlying that has to be some justification, some understanding of the reasons why these numbers have gone down. Yeah, and I'm, I, I'm under no illusions about uh, uh, human nature. I, uh, I'm not a romantic or a utopian, and uh, I think Homo sapiens is a nasty piece of work. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, um, you know, stranger things have happened over the course of human history. All the great uh, ancient empires used to practice human sacrifice, throwing virgins into volcanoes to placate angry gods. They managed to get rid of that, even though uh, human nature presumably didn't change, and, and um, burning heretics and capital punishment for shoplifting and debtor's prisons and all kinds of barbaric customs. Um, uh, eventually declined and eventually disappeared. And uh, so I, I think of the decline of war as something that's not necessarily permanent uh, by any means, but uh, it does seem to be a real development and we ought to try to understand uh, what was behind it. What, what is it about uh, human nature that allows both uh, aggressive forces like revenge and dominance uh, to, be, to do battle with some of our more peaceable uh, inclinations like um, self-control, like rationality, like uh, empathy, uh, and so on. So if you try to see what's, what's gone right in the last 70 years, lots has gone wrong, but, but something's gone right. Uh, we actually heard a number of them from uh, General uh, Ogierno earlier this morning when um, he made a number of statements about the overall conduct of war that I think would have been quite extraordinary uh, 100 years ago. Like the purpose of the military is to prevent wars, like the, our prime objective is to uh, prevent provocation, miscalculation, escalation. Uh, there's a general uh, increasing norm that war is not just the continuation of policy by uh, other means, it's not the natural state of affairs, it's uh, an abnormal situation to be uh, avoided. And I think that is a historical change. There's more of a valuation of human life and less of a valuation of national honor, uh, glory, status, dominance, and so on as a primary aim. There are more uh, tangible changes in norms that I think have helped uh, implement that. There's, um, since 1945, there's uh, been a, um, an understanding that uh, more or less um, states are, uh, the, the world is divided into states, states are immortal, boundaries are sacros sacrosanct. Now, that's not 100% true, but it is surprisingly uh, true. No uh, member state of the United Nations has gone out of existence through conquest since 1945. That's uh, extraordinary in, in world history, uh, when states were just wiped off the map or swallowed up uh, at, the, at the drop of a hat. Very few national boundaries have been moved around by force, and the, the uh, exceptions are instructive, like the Falklands, like um, uh, Kuwait in, in uh, 1990, like um, Israel in, in uh, the Six-Day War, where the 
uh, conquests are contested uh, to this day. Uh, there, granted, there have been some pushing at the boundaries, like Crimea is a disturbing example, but by and large, uh, the lines that were on the map in 1945 are still uh, on the map. There have been states that have fragmented. Uh, there have been decolonization, but the colonial borders then got uh, uh, kind of grandfathered international borders, and very few of them have been moved around uh, by force, quantitatively, if you count. So that's a, a second set of norms, just what you do or don't do if you are a member of the respectable club of, of uh, nation states, which the United Nations kind of uh, uh, sanctified. Then there are um, structural uh, factors that, are, that I think each, at least statistically, push the world, um, reduce the likelihood, although they don't reduce it to zero, um, so economic development, probably the best predictor of uh, civil wars is just rock bottom poverty. And once a, a country rises to uh, a couple of thousand dollars equivalent per capita uh, GDP, the chances of it hosting a civil war plummet. So as the world gets richer, it has fewer wars. Um, global um, institutions like the United Nations and other regional coalitions seem statistically to lower the likelihood of war. Uh, international trade and investment, when uh, countries find it cheaper to buy things than to steal them, then they're less likely to um, uh, indulge in, in conquest. And uh, it's often been said the United, you know, United States and China, despite the rivalry, are probably not going to go to war because um, you know, they make all our stuff. We owe them too much money. So it would be economic suicide on both sides. Um, and democracy has at least a statistical um, uh, effect in reducing the chance of war. All things being equal, two democracies are uh, much less likely to go to war than uh, a democracy and an autocracy or two autocracies. And so the rising tide of uh, democratization has uh, brought with it a slight lowering of the, the risk of war. So th those are the, the um, explanations that have been on the table, and I think all of them have um, some degree of validity. So one of the most interesting things about your book is it's not really about war per se, it's about violence. It's, it sort of offers a comprehensive theory in a way of violence and its steady reduction over long periods of time. So do you see, and you, you speak about domestic violence and uh, crime and other forms of violence, is there any type of violence that you think in the near or long-term future poses a particular threat that might increase in some profound or destabilizing way? Well, there's, um, there's a, a lot of, needless to say, a lot of unpredictability. There are no cycles. That is, I don't think that um, it, statistical studies of wars over the course of history show there's an enormous amount of randomness. There are unknown unknowns. Things come out of the blue. But it is not the case that if we've gone for a long period of time without a big war, then we're due for one. History doesn't work that way. Uh, it, it, it's uh, random rather than cyclical. Uh, I think there's certain categories that could continue to go down. Um, I think um, the uh, violent crime, um, homicide and rape and assault uh, have been sputtering downward and uh, the old idea that you'll never get rid of them or even reduce them until you solve major problems like poverty and, and racism and inequality have turned out not to be true. That when a country decides, let's just try to reduce the crime rate, they generally succeed. And even some of the most violent uh, cities in the world like um, Bogota and uh, uh, the favelas of Rio and um, uh, uh, Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where it looked like violence was going to be permanent, the rates of homicide have come juddering down. The other categories, though, that are much less predictable, um, whereas inter interstate war, you've only got you know, a couple of hundred members of the club to agree that, that war is a, a, a stupid thing to do. But when it, of course, comes to civil wars, it, all you need is um, you know, a, a bunch of young men and uh, weapons uh, which are pretty easy to procure, and they can call themselves the, the, the popular front for the liberation of whatever, and you could have a, a civil war. So it's going to be much harder to, um, for the world to see um, uh, an end to civil war compared to uh, interstate war. Terrorism is um, always tempting because it's a way of leveraging a very small amount of uh, violence into a very large amount of attention. The global toll of terrorism is um, you know, outside of war zones, it's actually quite trivial, for, um, but it is uh, almost by definition a, uh, a, a media magnet. And so 
anyone with a grievance could use a little bit of terrorism to inject themselves on the world stage, so I don't think we're going to see an end to that uh, anytime soon. Uh, and you know, then there are um, other um, question marks. Um, we don't know what climate change is going to do to violence. I don't think it is a given that uh, as the world gets drier, hotter, hotter perhaps uh, even hungrier, that it's necessarily going to lead to an increase in, in war. It's a widespread assumption, although the statistical studies don't, don't uh, back it up. Um, so I think overall, absent big, ugly, nasty surprises, which can always happen, and we, uh, but the systematic trends, I think, are toward a more peaceful war, you know, together with, with uh, uh, bad surprises. So let me ask you a question about how you came to this topic. And if, there's, if you could recount maybe some particular moment or, or some realization that drew you to the significance of this declining engagement with violence, maybe the visit to the torture museum, or one of the other episodes that you either speak about in your book or, or maybe have not spoken about. Probably. Yeah, I, I came to it from a, a general interest in human nature. Uh, I believe there is such a thing. Um, I don't believe that we're uh, uh, particularly uh, nice species. But on the other hand, uh, in encountering fears that uh, a study of human nature leads to fatalism or pessimism or, or reactionary uh, politics, like why try to make the world a better place if people are just rotten uh, to the core if we've got violent genes or a you know, violent brain uh, and people will just louse it up no matter what you do. And I, I pointed out that human nature, for many years, that human nature is complex, that even though we do have motives that can uh, result in violence, like revenge and dominance, human nature also accommodates uh, other motives that can push back against violence. Uh, Abraham Lincoln called them the better angels of our nature, and I, that was a lovely poetic term that I co-opted for the, for the book title. But it refers to the fact that the brain also has systems like empathy, like self-control, like uh, reason, like social norms, that depending on the circumstances uh, can um, repress the parts of human nature that militate toward violence and war. And it's a question of uh, what, uh, which of those components of human nature get engaged at a particular time and place. So my own, um, uh, the, the train of events that led to this book were, was um, pointing out on a, actually on a blog posting. My, my literary agent has a, a, a intellectual website called Edge and every year he asks a question. Uh, and uh, 100 or so um, scientists and, and other writers sort of speculate on the question. One year the question is, what are you optimistic about? And I pointed a, a number of, uh, facts that I was aware of, such as that a lot of barbaric practices got um, uh, abolished over the course of history, like chattel slavery, like tor public torture executions, like um, debtor's prisons, um, uh, and that the rate of homicide, whenever it's been quantified over, by historians over a continuous time series, uh, shows a, a downward trend. Then, after it was posted, I got um, correspondence from scholars in fields that I barely knew existed, saying that uh, there is much more evidence for uh, historical declines in violence than I had even mentioned in this post. In particularly, the, kind of the, the war nerds, the, the people who try to quantify how many wars have taken place and how many people get killed in them year by year, sent me their data saying, this is the way the curves look. There's a lot of randomness, there are ups and downs, but there's an unmistakable downward trend. Uh, and uh, when other people sent me data like child abuse is down, spanking is down, domestic violence is down, rape is down, I thought, gee, there's a, a story here. There's both a trend that few people are aware of because people get their impression of the world from headlines rather than data, and this is a big, fat, juicy psychological problem, namely, how could this be possible, given that human nature could not possibly have changed that quickly? What is it in uh, the various components of the brain that both uh, allow us to be uh, highly violent, but in, when things go right, uh, we can uh, repress those violent instincts? So this is a perfect place to open up the floor for questions from the audience. Right there in the center, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, Simone Garrow with Control Risks. 
Um, I first became acquainted with your work in a previous life when I was working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who, and Bill Gates is a huge fan of yours and yeah. would um, always t would push his team to read your work all the time. So thank you for that. Um, but to bring it back, this is very optimistic and great to hear, but to bring it back perhaps on a more pessimistic note, is there anything that's going on in the world right now or trends that you see that worry you, or keep you up at night? Oh, yes. Well, certainly the... Um uh, what's happening in eastern Ukraine represents a, um, uh, a real probing of the norm against uh, conquest, against uh, uh, territory changing hands by force. You know, granted, it's, it's highly limited. Uh, there, uh, Putin has sent in little green men rather than uh, tank battalions. So it's, uh, it, it, it's not like um, Saddam Hussein in, in Kuwait. Uh, but still, this is pushing against a norm that has probably done a lot to, to keep the peace. That just you don't, um, if you have, uh, if you're a country, you've got some uh, members of your own ethnic group in another country, you don't put on the table the possibility of annexing that chunk of territory. So it's worrisome that that norm is being uh, challenged. Um, certainly the possibility of uh, the, the worst case scenarios, like uh, nuclear terrorism, um, and the, again, the low probability, high impact scenarios of uh, possible nuclear um, uh, uh, war, uh, even if it's regional. Um, uh, even though I don't think it's particularly likely, uh, I think the, you know, the damage would be so catastrophic that we've got to uh, think about those cases. Uh, and of course, the, um, the, the uh, influence <laughs> Of, um, jihadism, of uh, violent um, political Islam. Of the ongoing wars now, there, uh, as of 2014, there were 11 wars in the world, which is a pretty low number historically. Uh, a couple of decades ago, it was in the 30s. Uh, of the 11, uh, seven of them uh, involve um, uh, violent um, Islamist forces. So clearly, the um, jihadism, Salafism, is uh, uh, continuing to be a big problem. Hi, Peter Singer from New America. Your work was recently referenced in a meeting that um, Ian Wallace and myself had with a senior government official related to cybersecurity. And they talked about how you had pointed out how there's all these trends going in a positive direction, <clears throat> except in the space of cyber. And he was asking us of, you know, how do we make it like that? How do we make cyber threats look the same way as what's played out in, um, we would say, you know, personal crime violence and also overall violence? And then a second part of this, um, one that's almost like a policy recommendation question, but related is that perhaps also an explainer for at least some of the things that we're seeing, that is, um, it is far more effective for me to non-violently steal the money from hundreds of people or thousands or millions rather than bash you across the head and take the money out of your wallet. I'd rather have a hundred million credit cards or the like. How do you both explain cybersecurity within this phenomena, but then second, what would be your recommendation to make cybersecurity follow the same patterns and trends? Yeah, well if, you know, I, I think there are problems and then there are really, really, really big problems. And so that's, uh, so for example, garbage and solid waste is a problem. Uh, climate change is a really, really, really big problem. Um, so I think, I think of cybersecurity as a problem. Uh, I think if our nerds are smarter than their nerds, uh, and, and if we make it a priority to make systems more resilient uh, and more secure, it'll be more of a nuisance than a, uh, a, a global threat. Uh, Whereas nuclear terrorism uh, is, uh, you know, uh, something that keeps me up much more at night. If, if you know, credit card records get stolen, that's a bad thing, but it's not of the same magnitude as, say, a, a, uh, a nuclear terrorism or um, a big war between two countries, say, an escalation in, in Ukraine. I don't think it's very likely, but I think it's a much more serious thing to, to worry about. Um, and I, you know, for, uh, yeah. Can we get a mic all the way over here to Tom? Great. Hi, Tom Ricks. I want to ask you about the medical argument that 
Um, the reason fewer people are dying in war is most people used to die in war because of disease. And it's the elimination of disease rather than a decline in violence that has led to declining numbers of dead in warfare. Yeah, it's, um, the, uh, it, it's true that in, in um, many wars in the past, there was, uh, the, the number of people dying from disease was greater than the number of people blown up. But um, that can't account for the, the, the trends that we've seen because, um, the, for one thing, uh, medical, uh, the effectiveness of medical treatment um, works on percentages. And to the wars vary along orders of magnitude, number of zeros, uh, as opposed to percentage points. And so there's no comparison between, say, World War II on the one hand Vietnam and Iraq, all of which involve different number of zeros, uh, compared to the medical care available in World War II, uh, Vietnam, and, uh, and Iraq. If you back project the most sophisticated medical care of uh, the, uh, the, the current wars and say, well, what if we had them during World War II, World War II would still be off the charts. For one thing, because so many people were um, incinerated, uh, nuked, starved, uh, uh, so that medical care was kind of beside the point when you have that sheer number of people uh, vaporized you know, or, or incinerated. Uh, and uh, even in the best of circumstances, medical care can only operate at the margins. The percentage of uh, people who uh, would have lived even without medical care uh, you take away the, the people who would have died even with the best medical care. It's only the percentage in the middle that can be pushed around by medical care. Uh, if you've got 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 as many people um, uh, affected in a war zone to begin with, the, uh, that drives the numbers much more than the percentage in that intermediate zone that can be saved now but couldn't have been saved in the past. Hi there, Anna Mulrine with the Christian Science Monitor. Um, the, the US military has a big deal moment on its horizon in January of 2015. It's gonna lift its combat exclusion policy for women. And, uh, and so that could in turn lead to more women uh, on the front lines of combat as, as they've been already. And, and it's traditionally also been a passport to leadership within the Pentagon. You know, so we can imagine a day where more uh, women are gonna you know, be in those leadership positions. So I'm just curious about your reflections on how women might, might uh, impact the, the future of violent yeah. conflict and warfare as they become more involved. No, it's a good question, and um, in general, uh, the empowerment of women uh, pushes against violence. Um, not that women can't uh, or don't uh, lead countries in wars or commit acts of violence themselves, but um, of the different categories of violence, I don't think violence is a single thing, and, and in Better Angels, I distinguish a number of categories of violence. But there's some categories that are definitely a guy thing. Uh, we have the expression, a uh, pissing contest, and um, it's not a coincidence that one of the two genders is better equipped to compete uh, by, by reasons of anatomy. I, I think it's a, it's a good metaphor that when it comes to stupid conflicts over honor, prestige, dominance, revenge, um, a lot of data suggests that that's more of a guy thing than, a, than, a, than a, a, a woman thing. Now, again, when it comes to more practical uses of violence, uh, that is, you're attacked, you have no choice but to fight back, you're playing a chess game, and, and, and at least the threat of violence uh, is to your advantage. I don't think there's a big or, or if any difference between the sexes, but when it comes to the more uh, stupid kinds of war, uh, I think greater voice toward, uh, of women will mean we get fewer of that, uh, those stupid categories of violence. And in general, public opinion polling tends to show that in, uh, even though uh, there's a lot of variance between countries in terms of um, uh, sympathy for hawkish policies between men and women. So in one country, you might have more hawkish women than you have hawkish men in another country. Within a given country, there is almost always a gender gap uh, and where men are more hawkish than women by a certain number of percentage points. Big enough so that the, um, for example, the uh, both elections of George W. Bush would have been reversed if only women had had the vote. Um, and women in American elections have favored the more 
uh, dovish candidate in uh, election after election. Again, it's not an all or none difference, but it's enough of a statistical difference that as women have a bigger voice, I think that uh, nibbles away at the probability of war. So we're out of time. Thank you so much. Let's all uh, join together and thank uh, Professor Picker for thank you.